Welcome back everybody, this is Jason Williams and I want to welcome you again to our Hospital Medicine Point of Care Ultrasound course, Lung Ultrasound. This is the third part in our series. If you've missed the first two, you can go to my website at proceduralist.org to view the first two parts. We've already covered A lines and B lines and applying those concepts to volume status and CHF management in part ones and part two. But ultrasound can be used for a lot of other lung pathology as well, such as pneumonia, atelectasis, pleural effusion, and pneumothorax. Ultrasound is very good at identifying these four pathologic conditions in the lung, but they come up less commonly in my day-to-day -day practice as a hospitalist. That's why I really want to start with A and B lines and volume status management before getting into these parts. We'll talk a little bit about why these areas are a little less useful, but I'll say at least once a month I'll apply ultrasound to a pneumonia, atelectasis, pleural effusion, or pneumothorax case. They're very useful sometimes, so I do want to make sure you're familiar with these concepts. So let's start with pneumonia. So first of all, like we've talked about previously, lung ultrasound is much more sensitive for picking up pneumonias compared to chest x-ray. For instance, this was a patient who had a cough, shortness of breath, fever, he was tachycardic to 135 beats per minute, he was tachypneic with a respiratory rate of 40, and he's setting 90% on room air. He complained of sputum and pleuritic chest pain. He sounded like pneumonia, but the chest x-ray was rather benign. It said possible pneumonia in the left lung base. So when we put the ultrasound on this patient, we'll see in a second, turned out to have pneumonia. But you may suspect from his initial presentation, he sounds a lot like a pneumonia patient. So there's some caveats to the point of care ultrasound data when it comes to pneumonia. Most studies include patients just like this. It's very narrow selection criteria. They're looking for patients that have multiple complaints consistent with pneumonia. And what they do is they end up lowering the prevalence of CHF in these data sets. For instance, the patient has to have a combination of fever or shortness of breath or cough or tachycardia and some number of those things, which tends to make CHF less likely. Because as we've learned, B lines occur in both CHF and pneumonia. And so you can see the specificity of lung ultrasound is not great because pneumonia can mimic several other pulmonary conditions. So here is the ultrasound we placed on this patient. The chest x-ray wasn't obvious, but when you put the probe on this patient's left lower lung zone, you see there's clearly several B lines popping up, as well as what we'll call a subpleural consolidation up here. This is consistent with pneumonia and, and made the diagnosis in this case. Another caveat is a lot of these studies that look at a sensitivity of 90% for lung ultrasound are scanning eight to 10 lung zones, which is more than often we do clinically. I've endorsed usually a six zone protocol where you look anterior, lateral, and posterior on both lungs to get six zones. But if you really wanna be sensitive for pneumonia, you probably have to look at more zones to increase your sensitivity. And we talked about there's a lot of false positives that B lines can be caused by interstitial lung disease, pulmonary embolism, cancer, um, even COPD occasionally will give you a couple B lines in the lower lobes I found clinically as well. And so all of these things, including congestive heart failure, can give you B lines. So that being said, how do we distinguish pneumonia with ultrasound? What are some clues that what we're seeing on ultrasound may be in pneumonia outside of the usual clinical indications like fever and cough and sputum production? Those three clues will be asymmetry, subpleural consolidations, or lobar consolidations. If you see any one of these characteristics along with B lines, that increases the likelihood that you're looking at a pneumonia. So let's go through each one of these. So here's an example of an asymmetric B line distribution. This patient has A lines anteriorly, A lines in the right lateral lobe, but when you place the probe on the left side, you have this focal B line infiltrate. So when you have three B lines, it tells you it's a clinically significant infiltrate in this area. This asymmetry is more common with pneumonia and less common with CHF, which tends to be bilateral uh, in distribution. So this would make pneumonia more likely and CHF less likely given the asymmetric distribution. But there's some caveats to that. So here's a patient with multilobar pneumonia. For instance, COVID is commonly symmetric and commonly starts in the posterior lower lobes. So this patient has pneumonia, but they're gonna have bilateral B lines in the lower lobes, plus some anterior ones up here. And so this is gonna look like CHF. So pneumonia can be asymmetric, but it can also be symmetric. 
When you have symmetric B lines, then you have to use your other clinical criteria like fever, cough, sputum production to raise the probability of pneumonia versus a patient that has lower extremity swelling, shortness of breath, and a history of heart failure is more likely to have CHF when you see bilateral B lines. So the clinical integration is really key. Let's talk about subpleural consolidation. That's going to increase our specificity for pneumonia. So normally your pleural line is going to be white and go across the screen. But here the pleural line is interrupted. We have a hypoechoic or black spot up against the pleura. This irregular pleural line and hypodensity is due to pus starting to fill the lung here and make it behave more like a solid organ. And we have B lines arising from this. So this doesn't happen with CHF. This is an inflammatory infiltrate in the lung causing the subpleural consolidation. So if you see subpleural consolidations, the likelihood of pneumonia goes up and CHF decreases quite a bit. But you can also see some subpleural consolidations with, with pulmonary embolisms as well, because this could be a subpleural infarction. And this is why patients have a lot of pleuritic chest pain with pulmonary embolisms, because they get these subpleural infarctions. So anytime you see a subpleural consolidation, think pneumonia or PE, and then you have to, again, integrate into the clinical context of what the patient, other symptoms, physical exam, labs, etc. Here's a larger subpleural consolidation. So pus is starting to increase in, in the lung and causing a much larger consolidation. Here you can see what's called a shred sign, which is you have this irregular border of the pleural consolidation, like the lung has been shredded because it's filled with pus. You also see some dynamic air bronchograms. As the patient's breathing in and out, you can see the air movement in the lung, these white hyperechoic spots that move with respiration. This further increases the likelihood you're looking at pneumonia. This is a classic pneumonia with the quote-unquote shred sign and dynamic air bronchograms. When even more pus builds up in the alveoli, you get larger lobar consolidations. This is a severe lobar consolidation where you see the lung here is filled with pus. And as the patient breathes in, they bring a little more lung into view, which has B lines. So as you move up, there's a lot of purulent alveoli here versus just an interstitial infiltrate as you move higher up here. Some people will call this hepatization of the lung, where the lung is behaving like a solid organ, just like the liver. They look similar because there's no longer air in this lung. It's all been filled with purulent bacterial infectious material. So let's talk about this consolidation pattern. When you see the lung that's hepatized, it looks like the liver, there's a differential to think about. Consolidation means loss of air in the alveoli. The lung is behaving like a solid organ because there's no more air in the lung. The three mechanisms where you can lose air in the lung are compression due to pleural fluid. So if you have a pleural effusion, it'll squish the lung and squish the air out of the lung. You can also have reabsorption due to airway obstruction. So if you have a right main stem bronchus intubation and the left lung will get deflated, or if you have a mucus plug in the airway, that lung will deflate as well and the lung will collapse and all that air will be reabsorbed and the lung will behave like a solid organ. But finally, the most common is gonna be filling of the alveoli due to purulent material. And when you have filling due to purulent material, the smaller airways are still open. The bronchioles that lack cartilage are still open. And as a result, you can see air moving in those bronchioles. And that's what creates your dynamic air bronchograms is when you have purulent material in the alveoli. If your lung is being compressed, either through absorption or compression, you'll lose these air bronchograms because these bronchioles are squished. They're physically squished down and air no longer travels in them. So if you see dynamic air bronchograms, they're rare, they have poor sensitivity, but they're pretty specific for pneumonia. If you see hyperechoic white spots with respiration, that's very likely to be pneumonia, less likely due to reabsorption or compression. All right, let's transition to pleural effusion. So here's an example of extrinsic compression. You can see the black anechoic fluid, and it's taking up space and squishing the lung and causing this consolidation pattern. You don't see any dynamic air bronchograms here because the lung is being squished. Let's talk about how to find pleural effusions. So you want to work in this lateral to posterior zone. And you're going to point the probe marker towards the head in this mid-posterior axillary line. 
You're gonna slide to find the liver or spleen. That's the first thing you wanna find here. You got liver. Then you wanna fan the beam towards the diaphragm to identify the spine. So for instance, your initial beam may be on the lung. Here, if you fan down, you'll start to see a little more spine and fan the beam even further. Now you've seen, you enter the pleural effusion and you're looking at the spine. So often you need to slide towards the bed and fan the beam down towards the bed to pick up the spine in the pleural effusion in this gravity dependent fashion. Next, you wanna identify the diaphragm. That's gonna be your bright white hyperechoic line on top of the liver or spleen and it comes down and connects to your spine. Those are the key structures we have to visualize. Liver, diaphragm, spine. Here you can see normal lung is black or anechoic when it's above the diaphragm and the spine stops the diaphragm and that's normal. Let's talk more about this. So the, the lung, as you'll remember, scatters ultrasound waves. So ultrasound waves enter the alveoli filled with air and they're lost. They never return back to the probe because there's nothing to bounce off of. So we actually can't see through the diaphragm and as a result, it tends to be black above the diaphragm. Sometimes you'll get a mirror image artifact where the lung looks like the liver. This area here, the echogenic material looks like the liver. It's similar to an A-line artifact where you're getting a mirror image artifact with ultrasound waves bouncing between the diaphragm and the probe. The key here is identifying the spine and realizing the spine never continues above the diaphragm. As the patient breathes in, their diaphragm will come down and the spine will disappear. And the reason for that is the ultrasound waves are entering the lung and they're not hitting the spine and bouncing back. So even though there truly is spine above the diaphragm, the ultrasound waves aren't hitting the spine and bouncing back due to the air scattering of the ultrasound waves. And that's what normal lung does. It makes the spine disappear above the diaphragm. And let's compare it to this case. So here we've identified our liver, diaphragm, spine. Again, the lung here is anechoic or black, but we see the spine continue above the diaphragm. So we must have some fluid here that's transmitting sound waves better than air, those sound waves hit the spine and then can tra travel through the liquid back to the probe. So this anechoic space is actually fluid, which transmits sound waves much better than air, and that allows us to see the spine above the diaphragm. This is what's known as a spine sign and is indicative of a pleural effusion. Furthermore, ultrasound is much better at CT at characterizing pleural effusions. So here's liver, diaphragm, we have a spine sign, so that means something in the thoracic cavity is transmitting sound waves very well, and we can see echogenic fluid and septations. Look at these thick septations here, which when you see septations like this, this is either going to be empyema or cancer very often. This definitely requires a diagnostic thoracentesis to sort this out. An ultrasound can see these septations much better than CT. The CT slices may only be half a centimeter thick. Ultrasound has much better resolution to pick up this. CT can't see these fine little septations most of the time. Here's an example of echogenic fluid in the pleural space. Again, indicative of, a, of an exudative pleural effusion. When you see this floating debris, sometimes called floating plankton sign, this is due to high protein content, and it's either cancer, a paranormonic effusion, or hemothorax. Again, requiring a diagnostic thoracentesis, this is not due to your classic CHF. This has high protein content and needs to be investigated further. And again, CT can't see this echogenic fluid. Ultrasound is superior. All right, for our fourth and final pathology, we're going to go over the pneumothorax exam. This exam is a little different than our past exams you've gone through so far in the pulmonary modules. We're going to switch to the linear probe. If you'll recall, the linear probe has great resolution within six to eight centimeters of the probe. And we, since we're interested in the pleura, that's a very superficial structure. So the linear probe will allow us to investigate the pleura very closely with good definition. And you're going to switch this probe to a pulmonary or musculoskeletal exam mode if you have those.
You may play around though. Other modes may accentuate the plural line better. It varies by software and settings. So I encourage you to play around with the different exam modes to see which one brings out the plural line most clearly for your machine. So our first step is to find the plural line. I recommend identifying the rib, which will cause a shadow and below the rib will be a bright white line that comes out, and that bright white line is gonna be your pleura. This echogenic bright white line, you may need to fan to get perpendicular to it to bring it out, and then you wanna keep the probe nice and still so we can investigate if there's lung sliding. So normally, your visceral and parietal pleura will slide against each other, and that movement can be seen as this shimmering movement here. Some people call it ants marching. This lung sliding helps rule out pneumothorax. So here's another example. Here's rib shadow, so this must be the pleural line. It's a little harder to tell on this pleural line if there's shimmering or movement. So often I'll encourage you to use M mode, where you drop a single line through, and then you'll measure the movement of this single line over 10 seconds. And what you see here is the subcute tissue here, sub -Q tissue, bright white pleural line, pleural line, and because there's movement, it creates this granular pattern. Some people call this the seashore sign where you have waves approaching the beach, and you really wanna see this granular beach pattern, which means there is pleural sliding. The visceral and parietal pleura are sliding, creating this granular pattern, and that rules out pneumothorax. So let's look at what pneumothorax appears. So if you put the probe on this patient, you'll see the lung has fallen away from the chest wall, and so you'll no longer see the sliding of the visceral and parietal pleura. So here's a rib shadow, here's pleural line. This is normal lung sliding or shimmering. Here's a rib here. This must be the pleural line, because I see rib and shadow. And here we don't have movement, because it's only the single pleura here without the visceral and parietal pleura sliding against each other. Again, if you will place M mode across this pleural line, here's what normal lung sliding looks like. Again, a nice granular beach pattern. But when you lose that pleural sliding due to pneumothorax, there's no longer a granular beach pattern. And some people will call this the barcode sign, where you have linear lines instead of a beach or granular pattern. This loss of lung sliding is very concerning for pneumothorax. If you were to slide your probe down here, you may see the interface of the pneumothorax and the lung as it comes up and away from the chest wall. And we call this a lung point. So here, here's the tip of the lung, and then as the lung recedes, the pneumothorax appears. Lung, pneumothorax, lung, pneumothorax. And this is the junction as the patient breathes, you can see that the lung come up to the chest wall and recede away. If you put M mode through the same area, you'll see an alternation between granular beach and barcode. Barcode, granular pattern. Barcode, granular beach. This lung point can also allow you to map the size of the pneumothorax. So if your pneumothorax is small and just anteriorly, you'll find the lung point up here very commonly. But if you can't find if lung point here, 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 and it's all a loss of lung sliding, you might have a very large pneumothorax. And so you can map out exactly how big it is across the surface area of the chest by looking for lung point. One caveat with lung point is if you get close to the diaphragm and below the nipple line, you may think this could be lung point. As you see this alternation of lung and this tissue, but this is actually the liver and diaphragm interacting with the lung. So be careful if you think you're seeing a lung point, just make sure you're not by the diaphragm and you're seeing the interface of the abdominal organs with the thoracic organs. Again, here's a nice look at a loss of lung point where you have M mode here and you see a granular beach, barcode, granular beach, barcode. This is nice lung point. This is a rare finding called lung pulse. And here you see its granular pattern, and then something happens here, and then granular pattern, something happens here, and here, and here. This is actually the heart beating, and it shakes the lung, and so you're seeing some of that shaking or shimmering. This actually tells you that the lung is up against the chest wall and, and is rules out pneumothorax because you're transmitting the heartbeats through the lung up to your 
Plura, what you're seeing here on M mode. All right, how about this one? We got M mode here. Does this look like lung point where you see granular beach, barcode, granular beach? So this one I, I made on my own. If you move the probe during M mode, you can cause a lot of artifact and shaking. So the point here is this is actually not a lung point. This is an artifact. You got to keep the probe nice and still when you're doing M mode so you don't cause some artifact here during probe movement. So be sure to keep the probe still to prevent any false positives. Okay, how do we diagnose pneumothorax? So you've heard me mention the loss of lung sliding is indicative of pneumothorax. And when you see lung sliding, that rules out pneumothorax. And, and the negative predictive value is amazing. So if you see any of these, if you see lung sliding, a granular beach on M mode, lung pulse or B lines, that completely rules out pneumothorax. The sensitivity of ultrasound for pneumothorax is, is amazing. Um, remember, B lines means that the lung is up against the chest wall and you're transmitting ultrasound waves into a wet, soggy lung. So that tells you there's no air between you and the, and the lung. There's no pneumothorax preventing transmission of sound waves into those lungs causing B lines. Ruling in pneumothorax is a little bit harder. So if you see a loss of lung sliding or barcode on M mode, the positive predictive value is only 56%. And part of the reason is the prevalence of pneumothorax is pretty low. There's a lot of other things that cause a loss of lung sliding other than pneumothorax. So causes of loss of lung sliding include pneumothorax that we've talked about, but anything that causes the lung not to ventilate, and that decreases the movement of the visceral and parietal pleura. So let's say you do a right main stem intubation on accident, then the left lung won't slide because the left lung is not being ventilated. Or if you have a mucus plug and you're not ventilating a segment of lung, that will cause loss of lung sliding. Or with severe, severe bolus emphysema, those big boli are not well aerated due to the severity of their obstructive lung disease, and you can get false positives with loss of lung sliding in patients with severe COPD. Anything that scars the pleura can cause the pleura to adhere to the chest wall, and that can cause a loss of lung sliding. So for instance, anyone that's had a pleuridesis, the goal of that procedure is to cause scar tissue to cause the visceral and pleura to pro to stick together. Same thing with a chest tube or thoracic surgery. Anytime you've violated the pleura, it can cause scar tissue and that scar tissue prevents sliding. Or empyema or pleuritis. I've seen a patient with graft versus host disease and lupus with chronic pleuritis that has had a loss of lung sliding due to just chronic scarring from pleural inflammation over time. So is there anything more specific for pneumothorax? If, if half the time it may not be pneumothorax? Well, lung point. The specificity, if you can find that intersection of the lung and the pneumothorax, that's very specific, but it's hard to find. You, if you really look thoroughly rib space by rib space, you only pick it up two thirds of the time. So the specificity of loss of lung sliding is not great, but it's a nice way to rule out pneumothorax. In other words, I wouldn't just throw a chest tube in wildly in a patient with a loss of lung sliding. You probably want to confirm that that truly is a pneumothorax before you start putting chest tubes in if the patient's clinically stable. All right, so in summary for this module, lung ultrasound really improves our diagnostic accuracy and care because chest x-ray just misses this pathology so frequently. Lung ultrasound is way more sensitive for pulmonary edema, pneumonia, pleural effusions, and pneumothorax compared to chest x-ray. This increased diagnostic accuracy has been demonstrated in patients admitted to the emergency department that if you use lung ultrasound, you'll be more accurate on day one in figuring out exactly what's going on in patients with shortness of breath. So I really think all patients with shortness of breath or hypoxemia should get a lung ultrasound because there's so much pathology that we're missing with chest x-ray in our clinical exam. All right, that concludes part three of our lung ultrasound curriculum. Let's move on to part four when you're ready, and we're gonna do a lot of clinical integration and diagnostic cases using what we just learned here. Thank you again for joining me. And if there's ever anything you wanna look up again, visit my website at proceduralist.org. Thank you.